can we develop better processes, better knowledge that lets us deal with that risk better than the other companies do so that we can actually earn something from the risk. What the diagram is showing you there is you come up with a risk profile, can be for your company, can be for your business unit. The little squiggles don't mean, you know, there's different areas of risk. And as a group, you've decided what's our risk appetite. So what do I mean by risk appetite? It means the amount of risk that you are willing to keep within the company that you don't feel you have to transfer out or get rid of. If you look there, you'll see that at one point there's a breach of the risk appetite. You've set an appetite, but there's a piece of the risk where you're beyond that. That means the company needs to do something to deal with that. On the other side, you've got some spare risk taking, risk -taking capacity. Get down in here. That means that the company has decided we could accept more risk in this area. And if we accept it, maybe we can make some money from doing that. Okay, let's switch gears a little bit. Why do actuaries belong in the enterprise risk management area? Well, we've been doing risk management for a long time. I think most of you would agree. What the actuaries can bring to ERM is a very rigorous approach to risk that makes use of a lot of the tools that we have already developed as actuaries. Uh, you may be aware there are other credentials out in the risk management space. Um, the financial risk manager, the professional risk manager are offered by GARP and Premia. They claim to be ERM credentials, but they don't have the sophisticated level of quantitative skills that we do with our actuarial approach to it. A lot of people talk about the CFA as being a risk management type credential, but that really isn't what it's focused on. Um, as the society started looking at the ERM space and seeing that CFAs were getting risk management jobs, what we felt was that that showed there was sort of a vacuum out there. Because CFAs are not trained as enterprise risk management specialists, but they were getting the jobs because they did have at least a higher level of quantitative approach to their work. As it says, the traditional roles that we have had in risk analysis all along are natural stepping stones to getting into ERM. So as we looked at what direction can actuaries expand into, this seemed the natural area. Having said that, how is ERM different from the traditional actuarial work that actuaries have been doing for 20, 30 years? <coughs> A couple of the important points of this, ERM has this holistic view of the enterprise as a whole. An enterprise can mean a business unit, it doesn't have to mean the whole company, but it is looking across the different risks. It is a formal framework. As I said, you don't just wake up one day and say, oh, now I'm going to do ERM. Okay, you figure out how you are going to approach it. It looks at risk in aggregate rather than in silos. You know what I mean by silos? Anybody? Where you store grain? No. <laughs> <laughs> you Kidding. stuck in your own little area. You know, like, you know, I, my company could be only a pension actuary. I also do five hundred six work. So okay. So you're stuck in your. So own you could area. be stuck in just a single line. You could be stuck in a specific function. Maybe you do pricing. Okay, and you're only worried about the risks that come from pricing not perhaps the risks that come from policyholder behavior or the risks that come out of regulatory requirements, okay? So looking at the risks in the aggregate rather than just in silos. When you do the quantification, it considers correlations, it considers internal hedges. Somebody give me an example of an internal hedge? Life insurance and annuities. Okay, all right, why is that an internal hedge? Someone else want to answer? <laughs> Does anybody know what the internal hedge is? Yes. <laughs> one one um, is a longevity and the other is mortality. Right, okay, the mortality has an opposite effect on the two of them. One of them you're worried about people living too long, one you're worried about people dying too quickly. So that's a kind of very simple internal hedge. The other thing that ERM does is 
It tries to get at the non-traditional risks, such as operational and strategic, and tries to find a way to measure those. That's really an area that's just getting started and where there's a lot of um, work to be done at finding good ways to measure those. In order to go into this, if you're going to be looking at risks differently, go through a couple quick examples of how skills have evolved. The then and the now means then is, you know, what used to be done, again, back when I started working as an actuary or even, you know, for a while after that. If you're doing pricing, setting rates and costs, what you used to look at is a couple of classification ratings. You might look at age and sex. You might try to look if there's any relation between the two. Now it's much more predictive modeling of policyholder behavior. What are all of the things that can happen? How can people be influenced by the markets, by what's going on in the world? Reserves. In the past, it's been a point estimate. Now, as you're probably aware, we're looking at principles-based approaches to reserves. We're doing modeling that gives us ranges of reserves. We're doing sensitivities to say, what's the risk if interest rates change? What's the risk if mortality changes? Mega risk. If you went back, um, often we think of that as being more on the casualty side, hurricanes. Used to be you'd look back and say, well, what's happened over the last 40 or 50 years? You know how many hurricanes there are that have been called a one in a hundred years event? I think there have been five or six in my lifetime. <laughs> I'm not a hundred yet. <laughs> now there's much more sophisticated catastrophe models to look at those things. At the capital level, I mentioned this a little before, initially capital wasn't even like on the radar screen of what people looked at at a company. Then there started becoming formula-based ways to decide how much capital you needed. NEIC, RBC, uh, the rating agencies had those. Now what people are moving to is you take this holistic view of risk and you look at what's the economic capital that you need. Allocating capital, when you're trying to look at different lines of business, if you even did it at all, it used to be done by the accounting numbers. Now again, we try to look at the economic capital in each of those lines and say, what do I really need? How risky is this line compared to the other one? Risk metrics, there used to be very simple probability of ruin, as I said, the NEIC, RBC. Now you do stochastic testing. How many of you do stochastic modeling? I'm actually surprised it's not more in the group. You'll get there. Pretty soon it'll be 100% of the people raising their hands on that one. And then unforeseen risks. In the past it was just, well maybe, you know, regulatory authorities expanded your coverage over what you thought you had to do. Then along came asbestos and environmental claims that had long tails and companies were not prepared for. And now it's terrorism, it's climate change. What's going to happen to the world? So all of these require that you take a broader view of looking at risk. 